Like it or not, organized crime is part of our city's heritage. Mob money and mafia muscle put Las Vegas on the map. The program you're about to see covers much the same ground as the hit film Casino, the gritty period between the 60s and the 80s when organized crime reached the zenith of its power here, but was painfully, finally exercised. Newcomers might not recognize the name of the two journalists who compiled what was to be named the best documentary in the United States. Robert Stodall was Channel 8's news director and resident historian who had squirreled away hundreds of hours of film and video from the earliest days of TV news in Nevada. Ned Day was the town's premier reporter, columnist, and muckraker, intimately familiar with both mobsters and lawmen. Stodall produced and edited, Day wrote and reported. Their teamwork resulted in this important piece of Las Vegas history, aired tonight for the first time in eight years but with a message that is still relevant and compelling. This is the Las Vegas Strip today, Broadway West, the great neon way. Money, power, sex, that's what it's all about on this street of streets in Las Vegas. But mostly it's about money. Billions of dollars in hard cash change hands here every year. That's what's always been the lure for the tourists and for the captains of organized crime in America. But in the past year, important changes have taken place on this street. A crime empire that ruled here for almost half a century has been decimated by murders and convictions in court. Now this boulevard looms as a lucrative open territory in the mind's eye of ambitious mafia families all across the country. Families that are now competing to see who will be preeminent in Las Vegas. Tonight we'll take a look at this situation so important to the future of our community. Who are these mobs? What exactly do they want here? And what does it mean to you? But before we understand where we are, we have to understand how we got here. And that's our purpose tonight. We'd like you to join us for the story of Las Vegas, the mob on the run. The entertainment and fun capital of the world. The grand opening of Wilbur Clark's Desert and... Big Harvard crime problem. I never got money from any of them. Organized gambling could be eliminated. Mr. Frank Rosenthal. Tremendous profits. It's illegal game. Organized crime invested in Las Vegas. Payback is the scary. Mo Davids, Mr. Las Vegas. Hard times make hard people. The chairman of the nerve to call me a liar. The mob on the run. Mob on the Run was supposed to be a half-hour program designed to fill a local time slot leading into the 1987 Super Bowl. But during production, it became clear they'd need at least an hour to tell the full story. That became 90 minutes, then two hours. And they had more than enough stuff to make it even longer. Public response was so great, it was re-aired two more times in the following weeks. Keep an ear open in this segment for a Kino radio broadcast about the opening of the Desert Inn. In the beginning, a pristine community of two or three thousand people built from a railroad watering stop in the Great Basin. A few gambling halls, saloons, and bordellos. Then came Hoover Dam, thousands of construction workers, and with them, the fast buck artists. Faced with the economic consequences of the Great Depression in 1931, hard-pressed Nevada officials legalized casino gambling and began taxing what had always gone on here before. Not many people noticed, not until the early 1940s. That's when Las Vegas caught the eye of these two men, Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Siegel had earlier run a race wire service out of Las Vegas catering to illegal bookmakers in the East. Lansky and Siegel had come up the hard way, in Hell's Kitchen and on New York's Lower East Side, bootlegging, gambling, racketeering. With Frank Costello, the boss of all mafia bosses in New York, they formed the gang that would later be known 
as Murder Incorporated. But as Lansky and Siegel drove into Las Vegas in 1941, they had something else on their minds. Lansky had a grand vision, a vision of glittering gambling palaces in the barren desert. In 1946, the lansky siegel costello Combine invested $6 million. The Flamingo Hotel was built, and Meyer Lansky's vision became a glitzy, glamorous reality. Las Vegas as we know it was born. And the brash, handsome Bugsy Siegel with his silent partners, Lansky and Costello, thus became the casino industry's very first mob frontman. Well, if uh, you didn't know his background, you would think that he was a character actor in the movies. He was a very handsome man. Wasn't too well-spoken because, you know, he used a lot of epithets. But there isn't anybody in the movie world that he didn't know. But Siegel's reign as a Las Vegas glamour boy would not last long. A business dispute with his silent partners ended in the Hollywood bungalow of his lover, Virginia Hill. Bugsy Siegel's career had come to an abrupt end in 1947. But the bad seed had been sown in Las Vegas. Soon others followed in Siegel's footsteps. Men like Ice Pick Willie Alderman, Gus Greenbaum, Mo Sedway, whose nephew Marvin Sedway is now a Nevada State Assemblyman. Men like Ross Miller, the father of Nevada's current Lieutenant Governor Bob Miller. They had been illegal gamblers in the East, bootleggers, speakeasy owners, men whose operations had made them business associates of that insidious organization known as the mob, the syndicate, the mafia, La Casa Nostra. These were the men who pioneered Las Vegas, building the Flamingo, the Desert Inn, the Sands, the Thunderbird, the Riviera, our founding fathers, Lansky, Sedway, Alderman, Costello, men of such notoriety that the famed Kefauver Crime Commission made them the focus of national attention. In 1951, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver made a determined effort to uncover the organized crime system that linked every city in the United States in a network of evil and corruption. Continual clashes between committee members and the witnesses sometimes brought lighter moments too, as in this exchange between Kefauver and Frank Costello, alleged prime minister of the crime empire. Bearing in mind all that you have gained and received in wealth, what have you ever done for your country as a good citizen? Well, I don't know what you claim, what, I, what, what you mean by that. Well, you're looking back over the years now to that time when you became a citizen. I mean, now standing 20 odd years after that. You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as an American citizen. If so, what are they? Paid my tax. <laughs> For three straight days, Mr. Costello is the number one attraction at the hearings. He bows only temporarily before a lady in mink the former Virginia Hill, reportedly the one-time girlfriend of the murdered gangster Bugsy Siegel. She tells the Senate investigators she never took money from any of the racket mob. Did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Maya Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those None fellas. of those fellas. None of, the, uh, none none of these that I've been reading about or none that I knew, they never gave me anything. Perhaps the best known of these old timers still in Las Vegas is Morris B. Mo Dalitz. He and his partners, Sam Tucker and Morris Kleinman, had been known in Cleveland as the Mayfair Road Gang. They came to Las Vegas in 1950 and joined forces with a former San Diego bellhop, Wilbur Clark. Together they built the Desert Inn Hotel. Clark's name appeared on the marquee, and some say he was the best salesman Las Vegas ever had. Dalitz, Tucker, and Kleinman ran the casino. Penny Goodman, the orchestra, a bugle call rag. 15 before 12 noon on KENO and the big event tonight, the grand opening of Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn Hotel and Casino out there on Highway 91 with Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Should be a lot of fun, folks. Now Mo Dalitz is in his mid-80s, a kindly, grandfatherly figure one of the most revered and loved men in Las Vegas. There's one person in this town, I think, that represents Las Vegas for his strength, for his intelligence, for his toughness, for his wisdom, for his gentleness, 
And when I said what I'd give an award to Mo Dallas, I was so thrilled. I would have flown in, which I don't do usually, but I'm glad I'm here anyhow working, thank God. But anyhow, I would like to give this plaque to you. Oh, it's beautiful. With love and affection from everybody, but especially me. And it says, the Anti-Defamation League of the Neighborhood Society of Fellows proudly presents its Torch of Liberty Award to M.B. Dalitz. In grateful recognition of decades of commitment to people in need, to bettering our community, and to strengthening our democracy, and the people of Nevada have earned for you the love and the admiration of people everywhere. Starting with me, a pleasure to give this to you. Thank you so much. Not only did he build the Desert Inn, he and his partners founded the Las Vegas Country Club, opened the Stardust Hotel, built the Boulevard Mall, Sunrise Hospital, the Sundance Hotel, and a host of other Las Vegas landmarks. Few would argue that Mo Dalitz is not Mr. Las Vegas. The county and the city are very happy that ADL would give us this opportunity to share in their time to show our affection for you in this award and share in the happiness that you have today. And the way we're going to do it, we have something to present to you that has been signed by, uh, unanimously by the city commissioners who were over on table 16 there. And it's kind of interesting that we're sitting there with the two people who will be making most of the decisions relative to law enforcement in the coming four years, and that's Golda and John Moran. And we're delighted to be sitting at that table. Especially since we've already posted this as a public meeting, and we can all sit down together in the presence of uh, every uh, imaginable sort of media representation that's here today. Mo, this is a work of art that was commissioned by the city on your behalf, and it's designed especially for you, and you can't see it here at the moment because I want the people here to see that it's a scene of the magnificent uh, Las Vegas Strip starting at the Stardust Hotel and the Desert Inn Hotel looking north, and in the sky is a big neon sign, Mo, that says, starring Mo Dalitz, Mr. Las Vegas. So I'm delighted to present this to you. But back in the 1920s and 1930s, he was something else. A speakeasy owner, bootlegger, and illegal gambler. There's a saying, hard times make hard people. How did Dalitz make the transition from his past to his present, from bootlegger to Mr. Las Vegas? Mob killer turned informant, Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano. Well, see, that's how these Jews got big. I'm going to take the Cleveland family, for instance. They had the Jews, these Jews like Mo Dalitz, Sammy Tucker, uh, Morris Kleinman, the ones that owned the Desert Inn. I think it was in 1940 or 41, they bought the Beverly Club in Kentucky. Well, they showed money. They had money to show it. The Italians couldn't do it. You give Italian a million dollars, he puts it under the, under the, the cellar. Oh, <laughs> how can he invest a half a million dollars? Where did you get the money? Do you understand? So that's how these Jews got made money, because they could show money. And the more money that they made, the more that they declared, the more that they could invest. See, that's where the Italians made a mistake. They should have done it themselves. Dalitz admits to having been a bootlegger and illegal gambler back in the old days. But he says that when he moved to Nevada, he paid taxes on his illicit earnings and has been a legitimate businessman ever since. Law enforcement files contend, however, that the Jewish gamblers in Las Vegas were never able to separate themselves from their Italian associates in organized crime. Italians who, in many cases, held hidden ownership points in the Las Vegas casinos. One longtime friend, familiar with Dalitz's career, says of him, a lot of people think of Mo Dalitz as a member of organized crime. That's just not true. If anything, He's a man who has tried to go straight, but who all his life has been the victim of extortion by the Mafia. What does Dalitz say about all this? The allegations of organized crime, crime ties. What do, what do you say to those people and those allegations after all these years? This interview was not supposed to touch on personalities or personal things. So I must ask you 
to forgive me for not answering you. Mo Dalitz never did talk to reporters about his colorful background, but Bob Stodall thinks that his statement, hard times make hard people, said it all. A few weeks after the program first aired, Ned Day ran into Daylitz on a golf course. The godfather of Las Vegas told Ned the show had been accurate, but, quote, they would have preferred it not be done at all. Daylitz died in 1989, and his memorial services attracted a who's who of Las Vegas. The palace, the one in Dallas. Then we booked the Amarillo Hippodrome. Yes, they loved us, but the fact is that they paid us off in cactus. Ouch, it's good to be home. We played the Roxy down in Biloxi, and we're telling you the audience was great. We played in Philly, boy, and we love Philly, because Philly was a dilly of a day. We played La Scala. By the mid-1950s, Las Vegas had been declared an open city by the leaders of organized crime in America. Anyone with the money and the desire could open for operation. Former Governor Grant Sawyer remembers what it was like on the Las Vegas Strip. After I was elected, then I, I do have a, a vision of 1959, 1960, when I was spending a lot more time down here as governor, and I began to find out who, who the players were and who did what. And, and I remember Moe's Place, which is the Desert Inn, and, and Carl Cohen at the Sands, and uh, Marion Hicks at the Thunderbird, Major Riddle at the Dunes, uh, Belden Cattleman at the uh, Rancho, people like that, Ross Miller at the Riviera. Uh, and those places, sometimes you didn't even know the name. You knew this was Ross Miller's place, and you knew that this was Cal Housel's place at the Tropicana. Uh, it was all very personal, and it was really a, a good old boy system. But behind the scenes, millions were being skimmed out of the casinos and funneled back to the mob bosses in the East. Federal Strike Force Prosecutor Larry Levin. The bottom line for the, the mob, or the LCN, La Cosa Nostra, is money. And just a gigolo, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. But back then, Las Vegas casinos rocked with high roller action. It was the hurly burly time on the strip, as the mob's gambling operations in the East faced increasing pressure from law enforcement, organized crime invested in Las Vegas. And with the money came glamour, notoriety and great fun the way we were. When the sun goes down over the western horizon, Las Vegas becomes a city of multicolored neon signs and exciting entertainment. Bathing suits and sports togs are put aside for informal evening wear in this Broadway of the desert. Dancing is a favorite pastime at the intimate sky rooms that overlook Las Vegas. Here new friends are made, old acquaintances reviewed. From sunset to sunrise, there is continuous entertainment in the lounge of every major hotel. The antics of comedians and the gay music of top flight musical groups keep the patrons in a merry mood as they while away carefree vacation hours. Stage shows that rival Broadway productions are presented in the dining rooms of the hotels. Beautiful chlorines in breathtaking costumes thrill the audience with their rhythm and precision. Nowhere else in the world is there such a concentration of famous entertainers who appear twice nightly in a variety of shows ranging from comedy to opera. Yes, indeed, nighttime is always fun time in Las Vegas. But in 1957, an important development took place back in Chicago, one that was little noticed on the Las Vegas Strip. Alan Dorfman, the son of Al Capone Gunsel Red Dorfman, maneuvered himself into a position of influence within the Teamsters Union. As an agent of Sam Giancana's Chicago Crime Syndicate, Dorfman began manipulating Teamsters loans, pouring millions of Teamster dollars into Las Vegas in the early 1960s and into the mid-1970s. The mob's ability to control the, particularly the Central States Pension Fund of the Teamsters Union uh, created for them an enormous bank uh, which was able to bankroll the mob's interests wherever they went, whether it's Las Vegas or elsewhere. 
So I think that the, the turning point, uh, the, the, the single most important uh, mob venture which gained them the kind of control in Las Vegas that they ultimately had was their ability to get in bed with corrupt labor leaders. Las Vegas in the 90s is said to be family friendly with pirates and parks and other attractions. The gigantic mega resorts which now punctuate the strip would not have been possible if organized crime had maintained its influence here. But it's also fair to say that the mob was directly responsible for Las Vegas' first great leap into the future. Ned Day picks up the story. Back in the early days, Las Vegas casinos had little luck attracting traditional sources of financing such as banks and insurance companies. So without the Teamsters connection, Las Vegas as we know it may never have existed. And thanks to Ellen Dorfman's manipulation of the Teamsters in the 1960s and early 1970s, the Chicago Crime Syndicate gradually increased its influence in Las Vegas compared to the East Coast mobs. Among the casinos funded with Teamsters money, Caesars Palace, Circus Circus, The Aladdin, Stardust, Fremont, Dunes. Stan Hunterton is a former special counsel to the President's Commission on Organized Crime. I think the influence of a number of organized crime families over the central state's pension fund affected Las Vegas dominantly by driving up the ante. Organized crime families had long before the existence of the central state's pension fund and its infusion of large amounts of cash into Las Vegas had invested in casinos or had points as it was referred to in casinos however those points back at that time may have been worth you know a few thousand dollars a month or a few thousand dollars a year depending on your level in the family organization the combination of the boom in Las Vegas and one of its early great growth periods and the rising costs of casinos and the huge amount of money infused by the central state's pension fund meant that those points were now worth 10 times or 100 times what they had been worth before. So the stakes became much higher. At the same time that the Teamster money was strengthening Chicago's hand in Las Vegas, rival mobs were contending with a new official awareness in Nevada that organized crime had become entrenched along the strip. The earlier publication of the expose, Greenfeld Jungle, pointing to Meyer Lansky's hidden role at the Thunderbird, had created a national public relations dilemma for state gaming control officials. Former County Commissioner Bob Broadbent. There was a bigger general awareness of organized crime. Las Vegas was always mentioned as a mecca for organized crime. Um, and. Uh, in my opinion, the boards began to say we've got a, you know, they used to spend all their investigative time looking at new licensees and not going back and looking at the old ones to see if they had to clean something up. And, and more work started to be done on that. The, the investigative forces got more aggressive, got, probably got more knowledgeable, better ties. Uh, uh, public opinion forced a lot of things to happen and change. Faced with the prospect of greater state attention to gaming control, eastern mobs began taking their profits and withdrawing from Las Vegas. The Desert Inn, Sands, and Frontier were all sold to industrialist Howard Hughes in 1968. The sale of the Flamingo to Kirk Kerkorian and the sale of Caesar's Palace to a public corporation in the early 1970s effectively ended the presence behind the scenes of Meyer Lansky and his New York Miami associates. It all combined to set the stage for the National Organized Crime Treaty of 1977, a treaty that guaranteed the Chicago mob of its preeminence in Las Vegas. <laughs> Keep the hell out of our 
Okay. The New Jersey governor's stern public warning, of course, amounted to little more than whistling in a graveyard. Out with the old, in with the new. Gambling had come to Atlantic City's boardwalk in a big way in 1977. And America's mafia viewed it as another golden goose, ready to be plucked. But who would do the plucking? New York's five families? Meyer Lansky and his Miami associates? What about the Chicago boys and their allies? By 1977, an aging Meyer Lansky had pretty much retired from active gangsterism. And Chicago's Tony Big Tuna Accardo saw a chance for peaceful accommodation. According to law enforcement officials, Accardo went to the New York mobs with a deal. They could have Atlantic City. Chicago would stay out. If in return, Chicago would be given preferential rights to Las Vegas. That treaty of 1977 made Las Vegas essentially a province of the Chicago syndicate. The man in charge, Chicago's provincial governor, tough Tony Spilatro, a cold-eyed hitman and enforcer for the Chicago mob. And so Tony Spilatro became uh, uh, a very feared individual in this, in this area who traded on his reputation. Um, and the very name Tony Spilatro uh, uh, would instill and inspire fear in many people. Spilatro and his henchmen had two primary responsibilities in Las Vegas. First, to maintain order on the streets, arbitrate disputes, and watch out for the Chicago mob's interests generally. Second, and more important, to provide the muscle necessary to keep the skim money flowing from casinos controlled by the Chicago syndicate. The Stardust, Fremont, Marina, and Hacienda, all ostensibly owned by the Chicago mob's frontman in Las Vegas, Alan R. Glick. Glick acquired his casino holdings with the help of $67 million in loans from the Teamsters in 1973. His umbrella company in Las Vegas was called Argent Corporation. It shows in a very simple way that there's no such thing as a free lunch. When Alan Glick got his $67 million uh, pension fund loan from Central States, there were strings attached. He may not have realized until years later that there were strings attached, but it is obvious now with the benefit of hindsight that there were. But at the time and throughout the 1970s, Teamsters loans were viewed as the milk of economic development in Nevada. So officials, like then Gaming Commission Chairman Harry Reid, were often quick to defend the Teamsters' loans to Las Vegas, acknowledging that the 67 million to Glick looked a little fishy. I mean, it's the man came to Las Vegas, borrowed 60 some odd million dollars from the pension fund, put 31 million of it in improvements in the uh, Stardust Hotel, uh, money went into the Fremont down at Echo Bay. Those are concerns that we have how somebody could get that kind of money. But if you look at the loans that the pension fund made all across the country, a lot of them don't make a good sense. We do know that the loans they made in the state of Nevada, without exception, are the best loans that they've made any place in the country. So how he got the loan, sure, that's an interesting question. And I don't know if there will ever be an answer to it. Bob Stodall and Ned Day continued working on this production right up to the last minute and were still tinkering on it the night it was set to air. They tried to include several subtleties and double meanings in the editing, inside jokes that they and few others might appreciate. Notice in the upcoming segment, the lyrics as Frank Sinatra leaves the set of the Frank Rosenthal Show. For the Chicago mob's Las Vegas operation, it was a raucous and very profitable party. Glick operated as the legitimate frontman, being hailed by Las Vegas civic leaders as the boy wonder of gaming. Frank Lefty Rosenthal, a former bookmaker and basketball fixer, appeared to the public as Glick's second in command. I serve at Mr. Glick's pleasure. And could you describe Mr. Glick's pleasure? You don't have enough time. Here. That's a good That's answer. Right. We don't have enough time for that. We see you growing more with the uh, with Argent Corporation, taking uh, a higher position, possibly. That's a question for Mr. Glick. And Mr. Rosenthal is in as high a position as you can have now. In more ways than one, Rosenthal reported not to Glick, but directly to the Chicago mob bosses who were Glick's silent partners. Whereas Anthony Spilatro was the mob's man outside the casino, Frank Rosenthal was the mob's man inside the casino. 
And I think that there is reason to believe that he was the financial wizard behind creating many of the more sophisticated schemes by which monies could be skimmed from the casino. But in the 1970s, the Chicago mob's boys rode high on the strip with their own casinos, their favorite politicians, and even their own star-studded television show. Tonight, live, the all-new Frank Rosenthal Show! <laughs> The fact that he had a talk show and went on the air weekly with celebrities bespeaks the arrogance that the kind of power that Rosenthal had can lead to. <laughs> A man who will take you inside sports as no one else has ever done before. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Frank Rosenthal. Why stop now, Henry? The unthinking acceptance on the part of the community of people like Rosenthal, to think that he could go on the air every week with a talk show and be accepted and admired as a celebrity in this town is now, in hindsight, uh, vulgar. It's a joke. Chicago is my kind of The wide variety and array of top name entertainment plus lavish stage productions is really what sets Las Vegas apart from anywhere else. Legitimacy, they say, follows money, a concept well understood by the boy wonder Alan Glick. He oiled the Las Vegas power structure with generous contributions to political candidates and local charities. In return, he was named the Las Vegas Man of the Year in 1975. But on May 18, 1976, a traumatic rite of civic purification began. A small group of apprehensive State Gaming Control Board agents raided the Stardust Casino looking for evidence of the skim. They found that some seven million dollars had been diverted just out of slot machine revenues alone. Dick Law was a gaming control board agent back then. He says that the state agents who raided the Stardust that day 
were more than a little nervous about interfering with Alan Glick and the Chicago mob's Argent money machine. As far as the community was concerned, I think Alan Glick at that point in time, despite the fact that he had had some difficulties before, i.e. the Latanzio matter and a few other things, uh, nevertheless, I think the community view of him was that he was uh, good for gaming. Uh, he had been made, uh, as I recall, uh, had been awarded the Man of the Year Award for his contributions to charity, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, he probably had a, to the naive public, a, a generally good, uh, a good image, and he, he didn't get bad press. Within 24 hours of the raid, Stardust slot machine manager Jay Vandermark disappeared, murdered later by the mob to make sure he could never snitch on higher ups. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, he was close friends with Rosenthal, and just by virtue of the his, the role that he played in the skimming operation uh, and the support. Uh, uh, that he received, uh, he was, I, I, there's no question he was in a position to implicate IRFs. Shocked by what the gaming agents had found at the Stardust and worried about the Sin City image that was inhibiting efforts at economic development, some local officials began speaking out. One of them was County Commissioner Broadbent. He says that back then, it was a risky business bucking Argent. I remember at the wedding of my daughter, I had police security. Um, for a while, I had some security when I went in and out of town, furnished by Metro. Um, I even had issued to me a, uh, a permit to carry a concealed weapon and carried it for a day or two, and then I thought, oh, what am I doing? It's crazy. I, you know, I know how to use a gun, but I'd never do it anyway. I'd never, if they were going to do something to you, they'd never give you any warning anyway and quit carrying the gun. So I guess there was a little fear. Back in early 1976, if I recall, it took uh, uh, some very courageous gaming control board members to attack the Rosenthal problem head on and to force him out of uh, his position as a key employee in the uh, Argent properties. And I think that uh, that, that signaled at least historically in this town, uh, a shift or a change in position on the part of the gaming control authorities. The die had been cast. Las Vegas community leaders and the Argent boys were headed for a fearful showdown. The State Gaming Commission decided to draw the line with Frank Rosenthal, calling him forward for a licensing hearing to decide on his suitability to work in the casino business. A stunned Rosenthal fought back with a massive public relations campaign. Good evening and welcome to On the Record. Our guest tonight, a familiar name to most Nevadans, Frank Rosenthal, who is entertainment director at the Stardust Hotel, a professional odds maker handicapper, has his own television show. You are also known in Nevada for a little bit of controversy, Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, right now, he is embroiled in controversy over the suitability of licensing as far as seeking a gaming license. Mr. Rosenthal, I want to clear something up here. You say that uh, you haven't brought the controversy on yourself, but let's look at your past record a, a bit. Uh, you cannot deny that there are numerous arrests in your past. Now, admittedly, the charges were dismissed, in, uh, I believe, 1963, correct me on the date, uh, the year. Uh, in North Carolina, you were convicted for, bri for attempting to bribe an athlete to fix a sporting event. Your civil rights have been restored on that, but that is included in what the Gaming Control Board cites as controversy. Another matter, 1967, the Chicago Crime Commission linked you to uh, organized crime figures. Now, these are the kinds of things the Gaming Control Board hammers away at. Don't you feel this could give them some reason to question your reputation? Certainly, I feel they would have reason to. Sarah, what you must understand, or I hope you might understand, is that gaming, the evolution of gaming, or the derivative of gaming was illegal gaming. I speak for the entire state of Nevada. We have all had some run-ins with the law. Rosenthal took his case to the Nevada Supreme Court, arguing that the Gaming Commission could not legally deny him the right to work in a casino. It represented a direct challenge to the state's gaming control law. Former Governor Bob List was the state attorney general back then, responsible for arguing the state's case in front of the Supreme Court. Well, I think it has uh, probably the most significance of any case that I've ever been privileged to argue in this court. 
uh, it means uh, to the people of the state uh, that uh, at stake here is a question of, of the future of its state's most important industry. Rosenthal played the role of an abused war veteran. I think it's more of a constitutional issue. It's uh, certainly a unique type of setting, a very strange uh, emotions that run through, you know, run through my mind, recognizing that it was not too many years ago when I fought for my country, and now I find myself in a position where I'm fighting for the right to work. But the Supreme Court ruled against Rosenthal. Eventually, the Gaming Commission convened and told Rosenthal to get out of the casino business. It provoked a stormy confrontation between Rosenthal and then Gaming Commission Chairman Harry Reid. An enraged Rosenthal accused Reid of double-crossing him after asking for favors from Rosenthal in the past. It was a confrontation that would earn Rosenthal the underworld nickname of crazy, and it illustrated the arrogance that the Chicago mob boys displayed in what they viewed as their town, Las Vegas. This was predictable. They would not even allow me a hearing. No inconsistency. When the chairman had told us that he would give us 10 days, whatever time we needed, until George Swartz spoke up in the kangaroo court. And today he pounded his gavel in accordance with his commissioners. I call him a hypocrite and the fellow members of this commission to deny me a fair hearing I'd like to answer that while we're here. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal is being very typical to this point. He's lying. The only time I've ever been in the Stardust Hotel was with Brian Greenspun long prior to Mike getting on the commission. And, uh, in fact, I rode in the same car with Mr. Uh, Brian Greenspun. And he had lunch with me in the Stardust Hotel and Brian Greenspun. And was, was that a lie, too? Well, I, we ate, Brian Greenspun and I ate in the Stardust Hotel. With Boy, Frank Rosenthal at the table. You were wandering around. Thank there, you. I'm sure. Right. But that's a, that's the only time I've ever met with uh, Mr. Rosenthal and uh, his statement relative to uh, to uh, this being a year ago is certainly untrue. And uh, Mr. Reed, does this contradict the statement you'd made earlier about allowing as much time as was necessary? Yeah, and I made the statement on the record. I think Mr. Goodman, on behalf of his client, should have been able to put on more evidence. But I... And he voted against it. And I conducted just now. meetings. The, the chairman called me a liar. I asked the chairman if he had Jay Brown call me on behalf of him to prevent the Bob List story. Ask him if I'm lying now. Respond to that. Did he call my office and I've, speak to Jay Brown? Am I've, I lying again? I've stated to a number of people here in the press already that uh, I contacted Jay Brown. Uh, to seek my influence. About, about seven days prior to the election, uh, because I felt it was terrible for the state of Nevada for a story like that to break. I had been uh, given the assurance that both Mr. List and Mr. Rose also did not want the story to run, and I felt that uh, it was it best served the state of Nevada, and I think uh, time will prove that to be the case. But he did contact Frank Rosenthal. Public officials to try to kill a news story. Pardon me. I think it's the proper place of public officials to attempt to kill a news story? No. Mr. Chairman, did you ask me, I'm asking you in a public forum here, did you ask me through Jay Brown to assist you in stopping the story that's, that's now appeared? The answer is yes. Thank you very much for not calling me a liar. <laughs> More bullshit. You and, the, you and the O'Callaghan gang. I don't, I don't see where you come up with that. You don't see it? No. Who do you work for? That statement was put together. Who do you work for, Roger? I work for the governor. Thank and, you. and the legislators. But that statement was put together by the three board members. We're all so self-righteous. You did find out, you did find out that Frank Rosendahl wasn't lying about Harry Reid asking me for a special favor. The chairman had the nerve to call me a liar. But he didn't deny that one, did he? We'll turn no more cheeks to him or Claire Haycock or anybody else. Commissioner Haycock, do you have any comment in front of the public? You're usually very vociferous when I don't have a chance to respond to you. I'm here now in front of the press and the public. 
I would love to respond to you because you're very articulate. Give me a pretty good picture. We'll see what kind of catcher you are. When you're not playing solitaire with me. No, sir, you're not. When you take a good look at me. I'm going to take it down. We'll just stand up to the abuse of the state and the power structure. As long as we can stand. <laughs> We keep getting requests to show one of our dancers off. And we'd like to, Henry, could you play a few bars or something quick so Donnie can give the, give the audience a chance to see what they do? They're flashing me good night, and if I don't say good night, they're going to cut me off. We'll see you December 1st, 1979. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, thank you for tuning in. Good night. Frank Lefty Rosenthal did not realize it that night of his last show, but his time in Las Vegas had run out permanently. By mid-1979, he had been barred from the casino business. And in August of that year, the state moved against the boy wonder Alan Glick. The one-time Las Vegas Man of the Year had his licenses revoked and the Argent Empire was ordered sold. The Stardust and Fremont Casino properties went to a veteran Las Vegas casino executive, Al Sachs. Sachs also operated the Sundance Hotel downtown under a lease agreement with Sundance owner, Mo Dalitz. Sachs promised that his would be a new era at the Stardust and Fremont. Uh, again, the Stardust and the Fremont have been linked with Chicago Underworld figures. What guarantees do you have that they will not play a role at the Stardust at this time? They will not play a role because I am, I'll be managing and running it, and there won't, won't be any outside influences. But despite the rejoicing among the officials who had forced the departure of Alan Glick and Frank Rosenthal, some people had reservations about the sale to Al Sachs. Gaming agent Dick Law. We did some research uh, on Al Sachs at that time, and we found uh, uh, quite a bit of information that was quite incriminatory with regard to Al Sachs. And so, uh, well, I'm not going to say that I know for certain that Al Sachs was, you know, part of organized crime, et cetera, et cetera, but I just would say at that point in time, uh, uh, I was not very happy about it. And, you know, every time you'd change, you'd think, well, you've gotten rid of the bad guys and the good guys are in and you were very willing to take a chance and change because you didn't like what was there before. You didn't want to put everybody out of work, and you hoped that the people that were coming in were all right. And so uh, in some ways, uh, you know what you, you didn't know what you were going to get, but you knew what you had and didn't like it. At his licensing hearing for the Stardust Fremont acquisition, Sachs faced questions about his relationship with Mo Dalitz, the former bootlegger and co-founder of Modern Las Vegas. It was a relationship that troubled some state gaming control officials. Well, Mr. Uh, Sachs, the reason I'm asking these questions, I have previously made a statement, um, which I fairly well hold with right now, that that, that I have some concerns about Mr. Dalitz's involvement in gaming. I don't have Mr. Dalitz's investigation or a summary before me, but I, I you know, I, I have that concern, yeah. and I have that concern at this time. And I just want to reaffirm that to you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm curious if he has any influence over you. I am curious about the financial arrangements that you probably will end up having at the uh, Sundance mm -hmm. downtown. Have you consulted him regarding the acquisition of the Carrot and Fremont no, properties? absolutely not. He knows I'm doing it. You know, naturally, everybody in town knows it. But, uh, but uh, as far as any, any, uh, any uh, advice, uh, I can't remember ever asking him for it. But Sachs would get his license, despite the questions. And four years later, in 1983, another gaming control raid at the Stardust found evidence that despite the change in ownership, not much else had changed in the Stardust Casino. Four Stardust executives, but not Sachs, were indicted for a phony Phil Slip skimming scheme. 
no evidence was offered in this case as to where the skim money went because of the nature of the charges. The charges were narrow. It was confined to a tax fraud uh, within the state of Nevada, and all of the evidence was confined to the activities within the casino. Uh, however, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, substantial additional evidence uh, which was not introduced at the trial, but which would um, uh, support the uh, inference uh, clearly uh, that uh, substantial amounts of the skim money that was taken out the back door while the false fill slips were dropping in, in the boxes at the table uh, was transported to Chicago to organize crime interests in Chicago. It was not until 1983 when the state began the process of revoking Sachs' license, forcing the 1985 sale of the Stardust and Fremont to the Boyd Group that the Chicago mob's financial interest in these hotels finally came to an end. But while state officials confronted the organized crime syndicates on the licensing front, federal prosecutors here at the Foley Federal Courthouse were pursuing their own secret agenda. Back in 1970, Congress enacted a new law, the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. For short, they called it RICO. What the RICO statute did was allow the Justice Department in its indictments to articulate clearly to juries all across the country exactly what they were going after in these organized crime cases. Very often cases which are in fact organized crime cases appear as travel act cases or gun cases or gambling cases and the jury never gets the full picture about why these defendants are sitting in front of them on these charges. But the RICO statute gave prosecutors a way of articulating that the mafia was organized into various families and that these families had a disciplinary structure and different people played different roles and it helped prosecutors make sense of organized crime cases to juries. As a federal prosecutor in the 1970s, Hunterton spearheaded a criminal investigation of the mob's hidden ownership in the Aladdin Hotel. As with Argent, the Aladdin had been funded with $37 million worth of Teamsters loans through the Allen Dorfman connection. As with Argent, the loans came with hidden strings and hidden owners. St. Louis lawyer Circus Webby was the mob's frontman at the Aladdin, a fact that he vigorously disputed in the early 1970s. I have no knowledge of that whatsoever. I think it's unfounded. I think it's a figment of maybe the government's imagination or some other people's imagination. I have no evidence of that whatsoever. It took the better part of a decade, but Webby would later be convicted of defrauding the Teamsters at the Aladdin. His silent partners, including associates of the old Detroit Purple Gang and Lebanese mob boss Jimmy Tamer, were convicted for exercising hidden ownership at the hotel. Armed with a new Nevada law, state officials forced the Aladdin into receivership, taking it out of the hands of the shareholders. The Commission has issued an emergency order pursuant to Nevada law effective immediately upon service, suspending the license of the Aladdin Hotel, which would require closure of the hotel. The closure order will be held in abeyance, however, by the commission if the following terms and conditions are impl implemented by the Aladdin Hotel Corporation. Number one, that James Tamer, Edward Menazem, Charles Goldfarb, and James Abrams not come upon the premises of the Aladdin Hotel. Two, that the present officers and directors, Richard Daly, Sam Diamond, Peter J. Webby, James G. Abram, and May Ellen George not come upon the premises of the Aladdin Hotel. I think and I hope that this decision of mine and the other stockholders will bring to an end and put behind us the many, many hours of problems that have faced the Aladdin Hotel. And in 1981, the Aladdin was sold to a new ownership group. The Dunes Hotel, funded with Teamsters loans and operated by Ellen Dorfman's pal, Morris Schenker, also came under federal investigation in the 1970s, probing the Dorfman-Schenker connection. Well, I've known Alan Dorfman probably 20 years or better. I knew his father. Uh, I knew Alan Dorfman, I think, before he ever went to the, uh, uh, to become associated, before he ever went uh, and became associated with the Central States Pension Fund. Uh, and uh, 
I knew Alan Dorfman. Uh, I still know Alan Dorfman. Alan Dorfman does come to the hotel. He is a good player, and there is nothing in the records which indicate that uh, we should not uh, permit Alan Dorfman to come in. The day I'm notified that Alan Dorfman is, a, is not a person that should come into the establishment, we wouldn't let him in because I try to observe the laws as strictly as possible as far as the gambling laws are concerned. The Schenker probe has not yet yielded any indictments, but under the mounting pressure from federal prosecutors and state gaming control officials, Schenker sold his controlling interest in the dunes in 1983, protesting all the while that he had done nothing wrong and had nothing to hide. Now, let me put it to you like this. I can answer it as follows. I know there is no organized crime or any hidden interest in the Dunes Hotel. I'm willing to stake my life, my reputation, and, and everything I've got on that statement. Now, when you ask me whether there is organized crime on the other hotels, I do not believe that it would be appropriate for me, without having studied, all I've read is the newspaper without having studied the whole thing to give an opinion. But I'll tell you this, I'm opposed to organized crime, not only in, the, in Las Vegas, I'm opposed to it in every manner, shape, or form. In my 47 years of, 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 of practicing law, I have never been on a retainer. And I've had some of the biggest clients in, in, in the country and some of the most important ones. I have never been on a retainer by anyone that was engaged in an illegal business. That does not mean that I did not represent them when they got in trouble, but they had to be in trouble first before I would represent them. I had nothing to do with their business, never concerned myself with their business. I was also on a case-to-case -case basis when they employed me, and it's a policy I followed during my entire career, and I certainly don't intend to change it now. winter of 1978 and 1979 brought a cold chill to the spine of the Las Vegas Civic Establishment. Federal wiretaps involving the Tropicana Hotel surfaced. Wiretaps that would rock the social and political foundations of the city. First, the bugged conversations revealed that chemical fortune heiress Mitzi Stauffer Briggs, the majority shareholder of the Tropicana, had been made the unwitting dupe of organized crime which had taken over her hotel. Mrs. Briggs was unceremoniously summoned before the gaming control board with her lawyer, Jay Brown. They'll have to make a statement. We just cooperated and answered all the questions that they, uh, that they put question. to us. Yes. We'll have to ask them. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Mrs. Briggs, were you surprised at, at the, the whatever yeah. came out of the affidavits and the publishing of any I part? haven't seen the affidavits. So I don't want to make any statement until I've seen it. The mob's man at the Tropicana was Joe Agosto, a Sicilian-born con artist who masked his true role at the hotel by acting as the producer of the Follies Berger show. Gentlemen, uh, the majority of the people in Nevada leave us off with the gaming interest and they do that with pride, with humbleness. And we are happy to serve in whatever capacity we may be in the show business, whatever capacity as a waiter, so as 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 a waiter, so or, or as a bus boy to serve this industry because he's our bread and butter. But in reality, he was the mob's man inside the Tropicana, responsible for manipulating Mitzi Briggs and for carrying out the skim. At the time, of course, he denied it. I live in Alaska. 
for 13 years. I lived in this, after that for 10 years in a small town, Yelma, Washington. Now, if, if you're going to tell me there is an organized town, organized crime in Yelma, Washington, uh, 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 then, uh, then I must be organized crime. 800 people over there. Now, if you tell me there is an organized crime in Alaska with the Eskimo, you know, I, then I must have been uh, in organized crime with the Eskimo. You know, this has been other than the time I've spent in Alaska. So all those allegations of organized crime, because I'm a Sicilian, you know, but I, I, I happen to know right from wrong, right from wrong. I came here in this country knowing the law. I had a law degree in Italy when I came here. I, I accept an humble job as a flunky for universal food. From there, I was promoted as a dishwasher. From a dishwasher, I was promoted as a cook. From cook, I was promoted as a food supervisor for the Army and Exchange Service. From food supervisor, I saved my money and I became a builder. I bought a piece of land, a little subdivision, and I built my first houses. Then in 1963, I came here and I built a shopping center. Then I went to Seattle, I built another shopping center. Ah, where are all those millions of organized crime? Uh, are they behind my flunky job, my dishwasher job? Oh, maybe. But secret wiretaps and bugs had caught Joe Agosto red-handed, meeting with this man, Nick Savella, the feared godfather of the Kansas City mob and an underworld ally of the Chicago Crime Syndicate. Also at the secret meeting, casino executive Carl Thomas, back then a highly respected and politically well-connected civic leader. The topic of conversation as recorded by the tapes, how to skim money from the Tropicana. The presence of Carl Thomas at this meeting shocked the whole town. He had often been cited as the shining example of the honest new breed of casino executives in Las Vegas. Not the least of the dismayed officials was then District Attorney Bob Miller, Nevada's current Lieutenant Governor. Thomas had been caught talking to the mob bosses about his close friendship and influence with Miller. So had the shadowy Teamster fixer Alan Dorfman, who also claimed influence with Miller. A stunned D.A. Miller responded bitterly. Mr. Dorfman was a, a friend of my late father. and I can't pick or choose who my father's friends were. I, I've known him in that concept uh, ever since I was a little kid. Um, but, you know, he didn't uh, ever do anything for me or, or did I ever do anything for him? The highly respected Carl Thomas was summoned before an appalled state gaming commission. He surrendered his gaming license. And I'm sincerely sorry for the embarrassment I've caused the state of Nevada. My partners, and my employees, and most of all, my family. Uh, I further like to say that from, from this day on with this revocation that I'm, I'm out of the gambling business after 23 years. Other than that, I can't say anything. But this revelation represented only the beginning of the civic shock waves. In more than one conversation, Joe Agosto had pointed to favorable rulings he had received from the Gaming Commission. He told his mob bosses in Kansas City that Gaming Commission Chairman Harry Reid was bought and paid for. Referring to Reid by the code name Clean Face, Agosto told Savella, I got a clean face in my pocket. Joe Augusto, a small-time hoodlum trying to reach the big time, threw a lot of names around, not only mine. And while there may not be any punishment meted out in this life, hopefully someday he'll get what he deserves. The Tropicana was sold to Ramada Inns. State officials conducted their own investigation and cleared Harry Reid of the clean face allegations. Federal officials who permitted the release of these transcripts and affidavits containing bits of truth half-truth, innuendo, allegations and implication of relationship and association of the chairman of the Nevada Gaming Commission with members and associates of organized crime has resulted in unmitigated character assassination by association. There is no basis in truth or in fact for any of the assertions made against Chairman Reed. Federal investigators also took the rare step of publicly saying that they had found no evidence to corroborate Augusto's assertions about Harry Reid, who would go on to become a U.S. Senator from Nevada in 1986. 
But the Tropicana case resulted in the federal court convictions of Sevilla, Thomas, Agosto, and others. When both Agosto and Thomas then agreed to turn government witness against the mob, it set the stage for the biggest case of all. This time it would be the feared crime syndicate bosses in the Midwest who would be the targets as the strike force and FBI set out to lop off the head of the Chicago mob. Wonders never cease. They began to gather in front of Caesar's Palace at around 11 o'clock this morning. The pickets congregating in far more than normal numbers and violating a court order on the number of pickets allowed in driveways. Police maintained a low profile until about noon when the pickets spilled out onto Las Vegas Boulevard and stopped traffic on the fabulous Las Vegas Strip. How did you get out of my way? Huh? This is a park. This is a pedestrian parking uh, All right. Park right here. I can cross any time of the day I feel like it. Hey, Steve, move back. Move back, Steve. Hi, Hank. Hello, how are you? What do you think? I think if they're going to keep this way, we'll never get it settled. With pickets on the Las Vegas Strip and the threat of continuing demonstrations on the Las Vegas Strip and a stalemate in talks between the Culinary and Bartenders Unions and the Nevada Resort Association, the Downtown Casino Association begins negotiations tomorrow afternoon with the Culinary and Bartenders Unions. There are those who say those talks will not go well either and the threat of a strike looms over downtown Las Vegas as well. This is Bill McCarty reporting for News Center 8. The big news in Las Vegas in 1976 was a culinary union strike that shut down the town in May. But behind the scenes that year, federal prosecutors were hatching a secret plan that would grow into an even bigger news story. They were setting out to decapitate the Chicago Midwest Crime Syndicate. The skimming and hidden ownership within Alan Glick's Argent Casinos in Las Vegas would be the guillotine. Targets of the federal probe included Joey Dove Zayupa, the capo de tutti, or boss of all bosses. Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, Ayupa's consigliere, or right-hand man. Angelo La Pietra, a capo regime in the Chicago syndicate. Joey the Clown Lombardo, another capo regime. In Kansas City, capo de tutti, Nick Sevilla, and his brother. Consigliere, Carl Sevilla. In Milwaukee, capo de tutti, Frank Fancy Pants Balistrieri and his sons. And finally, the Fed set out to nail the corrupt Teamsters Union president, Roy Lee Williams, without whose cooperation the mob could not control Las Vegas. The prosecution theory, Ayupa, Sevilla, Balistrieri, and the other mob bosses had used their clout with Teamster Roy Lee Williams to arrange Teamsters loans by which Alan Glick built his Las Vegas casino empire. The mob bosses paid off Williams and then told Glick that they would skim a portion of his casino proceeds as their end of the arrangement. How that worked was a certain amount of cash was diverted each month. Uh, it was sent by trusted courier in a very circuitous route from here to Chicago. We know circumstantially uh, that individuals, at least from Milwaukee and perhaps from Kansas City, were also participating in that skim. In fact, uh, some electronic surveillance had an organized crime figure in Milwaukee referring to going to Chicago to get his transfusion. Uh, the man was not referring to a blood transfusion. Once again, the federal investigation Hi. sent shockwaves careening through the Las Vegas establishment. Then Governor no, Bob List was found to have accepted $3,000 in complimentary services from the Stardust during the years he was Attorney General. List would later lose his bid for re-election. Joe Blasco, a detective on the police department's elite task force unit, was caught feeding confidential police reports to the Chicago mob's men in Las Vegas. He was kicked off the police force. Newspaper man Bob Brown, a respected editor and publisher, pleaded guilty in federal court to tax charges in connection with illicit Argent Casino money being laundered through his business. Jerry May, a powerful political consultant and advertising executive, was also found guilty on tax charges stemming from the Argent case. Like the Tropicana case, the federal investigation of Argent demonstrated how the tentacles of organized crime had enveloped the legitimate Las Vegas business, social, 
and political community. These loyalties and these bits of corruptions come from all different sources, and the how and why probably depends on which individuals you're talking about. Clearly, though, there had always been a stronger historic association between organized crime figures and citizens in Las Vegas because our community was built on gambling. And almost by definition, many of the people involved in the early years in Las Vegas got their training in illegal gambling operations in other parts of the country, and many of those operations were influenced or controlled by the Mafia. Meanwhile, back in the Midwest, the crime bosses complained that they were the victims of harassment. Kansas City mob consigliere Corky Savella portrayed himself as a simple businessman. Well, if they find people that I know, say, for instance, there's Tim, Butch, Sal, people around here, Pat, all of them, any of these people, and ask any of them. They know me. They're born and raised. There's no man up there 90 years old. And we always a kid. They know of me ever harming anybody. Any human being outside of trying to help somebody. Tell them to come up, bring somebody to prove it. Outside of being informers. How about someone is being paid to say something? It's a different story. But the one that's being paid won't confront me. Or you. And say out in the open, say, yes, I know Carl Savall, Carl Savall. He's done this, he's done that, or he'll this and that. They won't say it to you, they won't say it to me, they won't say it to nobody. But they will tell them because that's what they want to hear. That's what they want to hear. That goes for the police department, most of them there, the FBI, the task force. That's all they're looking for. They're looking for some goat, somebody to pin on something to. They got a task force care. All they do is waste their our taxpayers' money. They ride around the market here, they ride around the market all the time. They look, they take your license number, they follow you over here, they follow you home. Big deal. In 1980, more FBI wiretaps surfaced. Union loan manipulator Alan Dorfman and Teamsters President Roy Williams had been caught on tape, conspiring to bribe Nevada Senator Howard Cannon. Cannon denied any wrongdoing. These people were not charged with bribing me. They were charged with conspiring among themselves to attempt to bribe me. And uh, they never uh, tried to convey any bribe to me or n never made any offers to me. But the scandal cost him the United States Senate seat he had held for 24 years. Cannon would lose to Republican Chick Hecht in the 1982 election. Back then, Cannon hinted darkly of political conspiracies and government vendettas against Las Vegas. I think it's uh, rather interesting that the government would uh, have that trial come along just uh, just before the election. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't know why it came about that way. With Cannon's reluctant testimony for the prosecution, Dorfman and Williams were convicted. Then amid talk that one or both men might turn government witness to avoid prison, the mob swung into desperate action with a message few could ignore. Frank Lefty Rosenthal, the former inside man at Argent, barely escaped with his life when his Cadillac exploded outside Tony Roma's restaurant on East Sahara Avenue. Alan Dorfman, the shadowy Teamsters fixer, would not be so lucky. In early 1983, he was gunned down in a Chicago parking lot, apparently so he could never tell what he knew about the Teamster mob connection in Las Vegas. This wave of violence triggered congressional hearings and testimony from FBI National Director William Webster. Gangland executions are our most difficult crime. Uh, they, can, they, they use professionals, they pick their time and their place, uh, and historically uh, we've not been successful in these investigations. Uh, this one offers us a substantially better chance than any I can remember to solve, and we, in, we intend to solve it if it's at all possible to do so. This is a good lesson, I think, to those who think that they can uh, get along uh, successfully with the, uh, the more vicious organized crime elements. Uh, there is no sense of obligation or loyalty, but simply one of survival. But Dorfman's killers would never be caught. The former Argent frontman, Alan Glick, saw the handwriting on the wall. He talked to prosecutors and offered to become a witness, portraying himself as a victim of mob extortion not as a partner in crime. A very thin line between being a victim and an accomplice uh, may depend on uh, who is the first one to the prosecutor's office to make a deal. Indictments came down from a Kansas City grand jury, and the mob bosses went on trial. Among the witnesses against them, Teamsters boss Williams, 
Alan Glick, the front man, and Carl Thomas, the one-time casino executive. Iopa, Cerrone, and Balistrieri all were convicted. So were a host of others. Suddenly, in 1985, the once-feared Chicago Midwest crime syndicate was truly a headless monster. But for one man in Las Vegas, this situation only promised greater opportunity. The murder of Alan Dorfman was never solved, nor was the bombing of Frank Rosenthal's car, which occurred on this very spot. Two nights after the bombing incident, Rosenthal invited a handful of journalists, including Ned Day and this reporter, to his home to discuss it. When asked who he felt was responsible for the bombing, Rosenthal replied, it certainly wasn't the Boy Scouts of America. In later years, he hinted that he felt his friend, Tony Spilatro, had been behind it. My kind of town, Chicago is my kind of people too, people who smile at you and each time. He ruled the streets of Las Vegas with a deadly fist through the 1970s and 1980s. Chicago's man in Las Vegas, a ruthless enforcer, tough Tony Spilatro, Tony the Ant, implicated in more than 25 murders, but never convicted. His so-called death stare turned men's hearts to jelly. According to early Chicago police records, Tony Spilatro had grown into a major league thug before he ever grew out of short pants, avoiding conviction because the witnesses against him either lost their memories or died violently. He came to Las Vegas in 1971, opening a gift shop at Circus Circus, and then moving in 1974 to the dunes where he set up operations in the casino poker room. But aware of his reputation and aware that he was the alleged mob overseer in Las Vegas, state officials objected. And the owner of that hotel was asked to uh, if he would not have Tony leave the premises, at which time uh, Tony has not been seen uh, hanging around any other Nevada resort. What was he allegedly doing at this hotel when you say he was hanging around the poker room? Could you elaborate what he was doing there? Was he the, uh, allegedly? He wasn't observed doing anything in particular. Uh, his mere presence in a licensed gaming operation was uh, abhorrent to the authorities here in the state. In 1978, Return state officials barred Spilatro from even ground. entering a casino placing his name in the Nevada Black Book of Notorious Persons. There being no discussion, the secretary will call the roll. Mr. Walsh? Aye. Mr. Hawk? Aye. Mr. Swartz? Aye. Mr. Haycock? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. This commission stands in adjournment. It's clear from everything that we heard today that nothing has changed over the years regarding Mr. Spilatro other than the fact that the federal authorities have created a situation where there's now a contest between the state of Nevada and the federal government to see who can abuse the rights of individuals most. That's all I have to say. But despite an open censure by state gaming authorities, few in Las Vegas would talk badly about tough Tony. They wouldn't dare, as evidenced by an embattled Frank Rosenthal in 1979, who even under state pressure of his own, would not disown Spilatro. Yeah. I have known Tony Spilatro from the inception, from the inception of his birth. I know his entire family. He is a personal friend of mine who I have not been able to associate with since moving to Las Vegas. However, certainly we both recognize the family ties and the lifelong friendship. In addition to providing the muscle to make sure the Chicago skim flowed, Spilatro set up his own street rackets in Las Vegas. His gang included enforcers like former Metro cop Joe Blasco, who left the police force and joined Spilatro. Enforcer Fat Herbie Blitzstein, reputed labor racketeer Joey Cusimano. They were all loyal to their boss, as evidenced by this rare interview with killer for hire, Lawrence Newman, a key cog in Spilatro's machine. Are you acquainted with Mr. Spilatro? Very slightly. Never, uh, our meetings were all chance meetings in a restaurant, uh, in a bar, something like that. Nothing was ever planned like a social meeting or anything. I've never had any discussion with the man 
about anything criminal, always just social talk. And if he's involved, it's a, it would be uh, news to me because I have no knowledge of it. You have not, in other words, never worked for Mr. Spilatro or anything like that? No way, shape, or form. But then, six Spilatro gang members were busted for a series of burglaries, the so-called hole-in-the-wall gang capers. Facing life in prison, another mob killer, Frank Collada, turned government witness. He implicated his boss, Spilatro, in a host of crimes, including the 1978 murder of Sherwin Listener. Collada said that he had been ordered by Spilatro to kill Listener because Listener had turned informant. Collada described the night of the murder with chilling dispassion. And I shot him almost by the ear or back of the head. Uh, what happened when you first shot him? He turned around and looked at me and screamed, what are you doing? And I shot him again in the head. Collada was in court yesterday. He is under very heavy, <clears throat> heavy uh, protection, as much as you find as the President of the United States. What about uh, stories that there's a $200,000 contract, mob contract, on Frank Collada? They're laughing at him. They're laughing at the FBI and the uh, Metropolitan Police at, uh, in Las Vegas. They've given this guy immunity for everything. Two murders. Immunity for two murders. And uh, like I say, was gonna, he was going to reveal everything against everybody. He can't. He doesn't know anything. They bought a pig in the poke. The man is useless to him, other than trying to get me to corroborate what he's got to say, his lies. But despite Larry Newman's protestations, his pal Tony Spilatro by 1983 was facing three separate racketeering indictments, including one RICO charge related to the listener murder. But it was the Argent Skim case in Kansas City that would prove Tony's undoing. Alan Glick and Carl Thomas had testified against the Chicago mob bosses on trial in Kansas City, and the bosses took a dim view. As overseer in Las Vegas, it had been Tony Spilatro's duty to make sure they could not testify against the mob kingpins. When convictions came down in 1986, however, Spilatro viewed it as a personal opportunity. After all, with all the old bosses in prison, Someone had to take control of the Chicago Syndicate. Who more qualified than tough Tony Spilatro? Mr. Spilatro, you said in court no, that you didn't... No comments by Mr. Spilatro, okay? Amid speculation that he was a contender to the throne, the provincial governor in Las Vegas traveled in early June back to the Empire headquarters in Chicago. His primary rival for power was said to be this man, Joe Ferriola a reputed mob capo who had escaped the government law enforcement net. On June 14th, Tony Spilatro and his younger brother Michael left Michael's Chicago home for a meeting. They did not return. Good evening. Federal authorities tonight have issued a fugitive arrest warrant for mobster Tony Spilatro, but he is still officially a missing person at this moment. Here in Illinois, a missing car has turned up. The 1986 Lincoln Continental Mark 7, in which Spilatro and his brother Michael were reported last seen in Oak Park. The manhunt in Chicago intensified. Speculation mounted. What had happened to tough Tony? Bill Romer, an expert on organized crime and a former FBI agent in Chicago, Romer believes the Spilatros are pulling a Joe Bonanno, faking their own disappearance to avoid upcoming trials. But others theorize that the Spilatros met with foul play. One theory, they were killed by a rival Chicago mob leader who viewed the Spilatros as potential rivals. Still others believe the Spilatros were liquidated by Eastern mobsters who want to take over Chicago's turf in Las Vegas. Spilatro Chicago attorney Alan Ackerman remained optimistic. I have an instinct. My instinct tells me that Nothing is really wrong, that there'll be an explanation for their temporary disappearance when they return, when they surface. Tony and Michael Spilatro were to surface again, but not in the way Alan Ackerman had predicted. On June 23rd, nine days after their mysterious disappearance, their bodies were found buried in an Indiana cornfield just a few miles from a farm owned by convicted former boss, Joey Iopa. Essentially, the bodies of both Anthony and Michael Spilatro showed very similar injuries. Uh, the injuries 
were primarily blunt force injuries. Tony Spilatro's family still lives here in Las Vegas. In fact, the family once operated a fast food eatery out of the building behind me. One of the Spilatros is a Las Vegas attorney. The family is clearly scornful of how the late mob figure has been portrayed since his death. Although no one was ever charged in the Spilatro murders, a Chicago mob figure named Al Taco has claimed he was part of the hit squad under orders from higher ups in the Windy City hierarchy. It is a time for us as Nevadans to take stock of ourselves and to reflect for a moment on where we have been and more importantly, on where we are going. It is a time to renew our sense of shared purpose, our commitment to each other, and the values that guide us. Perhaps never before has this time of reflection been so important. We are at a watershed in our state's history. The nation and the world have come to recognize Nevada as a place of great opportunity and potential. It is what we who call Nevada our home have known all along. It was Governor no Bryan's dream and the dream of other political and business leaders of economic diversification and future growth that triggered the showdown over the past 10 years with the Chicago mob. As long as Las Vegas had the image of a town dominated by organized crime, it could never hope to attract legitimate investment. But now, the absence of a ruling force on the Las Vegas streets has created a power vacuum in the underworld, a vacuum that others want to fill. There simply is too much cash floating around the Strip. So in the past six months, since Tony Spilatro's departure, East Coast mob families have been sending representatives into Las Vegas. Families such as Fat Tony Salerno's New York Genovese crime family. Salerno went to prison this month for 100 years, but he left behind 200 family members to carry out the Genovese faction's mission. Former FBI agent Jim Mulroy is an expert on the East Coast mobs. Las Vegas is wide open. Money is to be made out here. This is the perfect place for the New York hoodlum who was trying to avoid the heat to come out here and enjoy the sun and make money. That's right. That's right. I think all of the families, uh, open city, uh, however you want to call it, always want a piece of the action, and they always want to increase that piece of the action. And uh, I think getting together again and trying to reestablish themselves here. Right now, we see indicators. There is no hard core evidence at this point in time but uh, as to who is going to be the predominant family coming into Las Vegas. But right now, there are some warning signs out that Metro and the FBI were monitoring very closely. Last Thanksgiving, associates of the New York Buffalo crime family were captured in these undercover surveillance photos conducting secret meetings with West Coast crime figures along the Las Vegas Strip, perhaps mapping out a vision of the future. Lee Coppola is a news reporter who has covered the Buffalo mob for more than a decade. Uh, at one time, it was as powerful as any of the New York families when it was dominated by Stefano Magadino. But in recent years, it has lost that power. And now, if it wants a branch out from Buffalo, it has to go through the New York families. You have the same situation in New York. Heads of the families have uh, met their Donnybrook. They're ready for sentencing. But there are other people up there in New York to take their place. And they may find it hot for them in New York. They're going to go anywhere that they can to establish a a fountainhead of more uh, money and influence. Well, if you owned a plant and you weren't making money in your location, wouldn't you maybe branch out and try different businesses or different areas where maybe people were spending more money? And it's basically the same thing in the underworld. If there's no money coming in, for instance, a lot of money came in in factories because so many thousands of factory workers would play the sports pools every way. Of course, it's not like Nevada, gambling's illegal. So the mob always had its influence in the sports gambling network. Thousands and thousands of factory jobs were lost in the Rust Belt Depression. So therefore, that's a lucrative uh, uh, opportunity that the mob in Buffalo has now lost. Of course, uh, what we have to watch for is limited only by the imagination and ingenuity of the organized crime interests who would seek to gain a foothold in this community, or those which may already have a foothold in the community. But I don't think that anything is going to change all that dramatically. Uh, while great efforts and strides have been made in cleaning up the uh, corrupt uh, casino uh, business, uh, that is, those casinos uh, over which organized crime had control. 
Uh, nevertheless, the bottom line still remains that the most lucrative venture that any organized crime interest can have in Las Vegas is to skim money from casino operations. Whatever his vices, law enforcement officials say, Tony Spilatro's presence in Las Vegas created a measure of stability. Now the officials are plainly worried about the potential for a mob version of Hobbs' war of all against all, as other mafia clans vie for supremacy on the Strip. The one thing that we're concerned about is to, uh, is it going to erupt in any type of violence? And the sad part of it uh, is the innocent citizen that gets caught in between these two factions at the time this violence may er erupt. Uh, I think it's a very real concern of the community as a whole is the violence it might lead to. The Eastern families which tried to gain a Las Vegas foothold in the mid and late 80s are still trying. Associates of the formerly Teflon Don, John Gotti, have set up shop here, delving into the pornography business, but also attempted skimming and illegal sales of slot machines. Each plot was thwarted. According to law enforcement, the Buffalo Contingent is the largest traditional mafia group still active here. They are said to be deeply involved in telemarketing schemes, but their numbers include few, if any, made members, and their influence is small compared to the salad days of the Spilatro era. Many of the key players from that period are dead. Spilatro, Mo Dalitz, Joe Augusto, Carl Thomas. Frank Rosenthal manages a bar in Florida and received half a million dollars for the movie rights to his story. His wife, Jerry, died under mysterious circumstances in California. Rosenthal is barred for life from entering Nevada casinos. Another member of the Black Book, Joey Cusimano, went to prison for racketeering, did his time, and was nearly assassinated by unknown gunmen in 1989. He lives quietly in Las Vegas and has stayed clean. So has ex-cop Joe Blasco, who now works as a bartender in a topless nightclub. Enforcer Herbie Blitzstein served a prison sentence, underwent open heart surgery, and is occasionally seen in Las Vegas clubs. Hitman turned informant Frank Collada remains in the witness protection program, but surfaced as a consultant to the film Casino, where he hobnobbed with celebrities. Another informant who made good, frontman Alan Glick, travels worldwide checking on business investments, including properties in Las Vegas. He lives in San Diego, reportedly under tight security. Former gaming chairman Harry Reid is serving his second term in the U.S. Senate. Mob allegations about Reid proved to be groundless. Federal prosecutor Larry Levitt is now federal magistrate Larry Levitt, still putting away the bad guys. And one of the journalists who played such a key role in this drama, Bob Stodall and Ned Day. In a moment, their story and the conclusion of The Mob on the Run. What we've witnessed tonight is a story of epic proportions. A story about the rise and fall of a sinister crime empire. The story of a city born in the grip of the mob octopus. A city that struggled through a decade of confrontation and that now stands for the most part free from the mob's grip. Obviously with as many licenses and as big as the gaming industry has become in this state over the years, there have been some problems. But I do not think today that there is any appreciable or substantial organized criminal influence in the state of Nevada. I do not. But it did not come easily. Along the way, we suffered embarrassment, pain, and much heartache. We also learned some important lessons about facing up to the truth. First, those convictions constituted a challenge to this community. To stop saying that the allegation that organized crime figures were influencing casino operations here was an invention of the FBI or the Justice Department or the press. Now, the community of Las Vegas and the larger community of Nevada had to come face to face with irrefutable wiretap and physical surveillance evidence as well as the uh, testimony of insider witnesses who became government witnesses that in fact the mafia exerted a substantial amount of influence over a number of casinos. It was no longer deniable. But I think the most important thing about those convictions is the way the community has risen to them. It was not the public relations disaster that had been predicted by some who wanted to stick their heads in the sand and ignore the problem. In fact, the community has prospered and grown since then. And more importantly, those convictions set the stage for the state to take this issue on 
in a much more serious way than it had before, to have a much stricter set of licensing controls, to increase its investigative capacity, and to try to provide state investigators with more investigative resources and more statutes that they could use so that this wouldn't happen again. So now Las Vegas stands poised for a great leap forward into a new golden age of economic growth and prosperity. The future looks brighter than ever. But the price of that shiny future is vigilance. The price of the future is to never forget the past, to always remember from where we came. Organized crime doesn't have nearly as much visibility today as it did back then, but is it gone? In 1995, an internal report by Nevada Gaming Control declared the mob has virtually no influence within Nevada casino gaming. That report has never been released. Many other authorities have their doubts about its conclusions. The mob today travels under many guises, Asians, Latins, even Russians. One type of mobster may have disappeared, but investigators say a new generation of hoods has emerged. Dressed in three-piece suits, these nouveau gangsters inhabit the boardrooms instead of the counting rooms. The bad guys no longer have to steal money out the back door. They can profit from legal gambling simply by buying stock in public companies, which are operated by their friends. Said one veteran lawman, anyone who thinks organized crime will ever give up on a cash business like gambling is naive. Like the mobsters they chase, the journalists who produce this program are gone. Bob Stodall became the news director at WTVF-TV in Nashville and has led that station to news dominance, although he still regards Las Vegas as his home. Ned Day, whose frequent face-offs with the mob led to the firebombing of his car, died while vacationing in Hawaii just a few months after this program last aired. But eight years later, on an almost weekly basis, regular people walk up out of the blue and offer the opinion that Ned was somehow killed by the mob. We have yet to find any solid evidence of foul play, but the public remains unconvinced. The entertainment and fun capital of the world. The grand opening of Wilbur Clark's Desert and Hotel. Big crime problem. I never got money from any of those. Organized gambling could be eliminated. Mr. Frank Rosenthal. Tremendous profits. Illegal game. Organized crime invested in Las Vegas. Payback is the scary. No dealings, Mr. Las Vegas. Hard times make hard people for Jeremy of the Nerve to call me a liar. The mob on the run. Old black magic has me in a spell. Old black magic that you weave so well. Those icy fingers up and down my spine. The same old witchcraft when your eyes meet mine. The same old tingle that I feel inside. And then that elevator starts to try. Down and down I go. Round and around I go. Like a leaf caught on a tide. I should stay away, but what can I do? I hear your name and I... Put out the fire. Baby, down and down I go. Round and round I go. In a spin. Loving a spin I'm in. On the old black magic called love. Ah, oh, in a spin. Loving a spin I'm in. Under the old black magic called love. In a spin. Loving a spin I'm in. Under the old.